<laughs> well, <laughs> here we are again, <laughs> three friends um, from across the continent, um, talking about shades of life and, <laughs> and inviting ourselves to explore what's been on our mind lately. Uh, it, without necessarily resolution as much more exploration and curiosity about things that might matter to us might matter to others might not but um it's the delight in the conversation uh in the moment about what's uh, a, a bit alive for us and <laughs> I'm I'm gonna like set up something here a bit in in conversation because um, this has been on my mind for about a week. Um, I am one of those old school people that gets their paper in the morning, in actual paper, in and read it thoroughly every morning with my coffee. <laughs> uh, and if I don't get done, I keep it aside so I can read it over lunch or later in the afternoon, but it's, it's old school. And two things emerged in the paper uh, uh, recently um, that has been sitting with me in, 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 an, in a way I hadn't expected. So one of the things was a, a lengthy article about a recent study about how America is, is sort of, the REM, I'm losing my religion. And so it was an, a real deep study about Americans and religion and how we just don't go to church anymore. Um, and in particular, the past couple of generations really don't go to church anymore. Um, now, yes, there are some closed groups, but in general, the, the vast majority of Americans don't go to church. And there is another R and and. Part of the reason is, is, that, is this lack of faith or trust in the church as an institution. That's also manifested itself of late in lack of faith or trust in other institutions like government and education. So these major elements of, of our lives, whether civic or personal or family-wise or, or other, are, are I don't want to say they're under threat, but we're in the midst of two generations of our society that have lost faith or trust in significant institutions. We can go through all kinds of reasons about that. Um, but what's really emerged for me in the past few days is what are the implications of that for friendship, for personal relationship. If we are losing faith or trust in these other institutions, does it have implications for our personal relationships? Are we in a world of skepticism? Are we in a world of doubt? Um, hmm. I was just in a conversation, as I mentioned a bit ago, with a colleague I hadn't seen since 2008, and we were talking about a range of things. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, I only have one friend, hmm. one male friend. Um, and, you know, which really I was stunned by because he's a prominent leader in the community here in the Twin Cities or well-known, he retired this past summer. Um, and I'm just wondering, because, you know, there's other data that says Americans are feeling isolated, we're feeling alone, we're... You know all of that in in what's happening with friendships and relationships and trust and faith out there not in institutions but in our relationships with each other that's been spinning around for me for a few days now um because yeah so i don't know you know you have some thoughts either way but <clears throat> but i wonder <laughs> I don't, I don't doubt that you have thoughts. Uh, uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering where we are, you know, in that world of connection. You know, that's our work, right? 
<laughs> Each of us, in many ways, build connection, build relationship, build trust. Huh. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Dropping a bomb, man. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> thing. That's what you get for letting me go first. There you go. No Don't let Jerry go first again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Kathy, you want to run? <laughs> No, you can go. You can start. All right. I'll play. Uh, so, yeah, first is like, damn you, Jerry Nagel. Uh, you know, that's a big, broad context. Ooh. And I feel the juiciness of that, though, actually. And, you know, there's something about um, e even this very moment of the three of us having this conversation that you you just kind of laid out, Jerry. Um, it's got meaning in it and it's got, you know, and it's got depth in it and it's got like complexity in it and it's got. I don't know in it. I feel all of those things. And, and I actually think that we need more of these conversations. I'm the kind of human that hungers for that conversation. And whether it's in a working context where I'm facilitating and maybe in a, a different kind of scale, I don't think the question that we're extracting to ask of those people or invite, enter invite entertaining for a bit is that different. Like there's some question about what does it all mean or or for me anyway, what does it all mean? Or uh, how, do, how do we, you know, how do we encounter such reality with one another and follow a few paths with it? So I, I have some appreciation of that. Um, uh, ooh, okay. I, I, th I think I'm, I'm drifting back a little bit also to the reality of, Jerry, you get a paper. <laughs> and kind of a love of that, like a respect of that. I don't have a paper. I haven't gotten a paper for a while. But um, there's something that I can appreciate in that, like the feeling of the paper in my hands and a cup of coffee, you know. Uh, there's different ways to be able to do that, but there's something I can appreciate in that. In my disclosure of sort of an old school way, oh, shit, why am I even saying this? I write checks still. You know, there are some, <laughs> some bits of write checks. So maybe there's a category there about, you know, the things that we hold on to that are a bit old, but that still comfort or, you know, still actually are easier. Um, so, yeah, I think the best that I can do is try to pop a few things into that, that landscape that you just painted, Jerry, or drew out. Um, losing religion or something like that, people not going to church, that's timely for me, uh, not so much in a personal way. I have faith community in my background, um, but it's been years and I've actually, I'm working with a, a client system right now in a, in an educational week way, facilitation way. <clears throat> this is the fourth or fifth year that I've joined them. And my unit that I get to have with a bunch of pastors is around relational leadership. And these are people who they're younger pastors, quote younger, you know, they tend to be 40 or less, I think in age. And um, these are people who are working the edges of their own institution and, and daring to encounter that kind of conversation that you're even naming. I mean, they're pastors by profession, right? And yet they're also just these hungry humans that don't long to recreate an old and dead future institutionally. Um, but they, they, you know, they, they want to meet the yearnings of people in their sense making and so forth. So I'm aware that... Um, you know, there are, as tends to happen, I guess, with life is there are alternative forms and energies that rise up. And some of those are happening in, in religious ways. It's, you know, bar church or it's community night or it's dinner night or, or many, many, many other things. So it's interesting to me, I suppose, of how what you're naming speaks to maybe a shift in institutions and, and maybe specific institutions, but also the broader relationship to institutions like, okay, maybe not trusting the government or not trusting healthcare or not trusting corporate America, or, you know, there's lots of layers there. You, you raised, Jerry, I think a really important question. And I'm just going to jump ahead on it because it goes back to some of what the three of us were talking as we started uh, before pressing record. You know, I I find I'm the kind of person that that as introverted and self-reliant, well, I don't know what words to use there, 
as <laughs> I feel. I, I need some friends. I need a pat on the back sometimes. I, I need like a, a, and let's say I'm being a little bit trivial, trivial with that. I feel like in the midst of the version of complexity that I know and dealing with some of the things that you just named, Jerry, sometimes I just, I need like a little extra, hey, Tennyson, you're doing a good job kind of stuff. And maybe that speaks into the broader pattern that I think you're naming. When when we're in a, oh, shit, there's so many big narratives on this. When we're in a great turning, if that be one of the narratives, then perhaps one of the things that we need are the simple cups of coffee that I thought would be 45 minutes and turned into two hours with I gotta go kind of stuff like you were naming with, with your friend. So it, it speaks to me, I think, to a certain simplicity of, don't forget the little things that just conjure up a bit of uh, it, it's like, like it's not just talking about the ball game or the weather, but that can be included. I think it's somehow touching like these, these deeper yearnings that we have as human beings, whether we're in families, communities, jobs, you know, whatever it might be, or movements to be able to touch into the, you know, to be deliberate about touching the relational because we needed ourselves. I'm speaking me, but I'm projecting it out to more. We needed ourselves. And I think we need it as species. Oh gosh, that's a lot. I better stop there. <laughs> all, all true, but you know, you can't help but start to conjecture a bunch and all of that. You're not passionate about that at all, are you, Tennyson? Yeah, I just waved my arms a bunch. Didn't <laughs> I? Like that was a lot. <laughs> oh, well. Um so much sparking uh, including what exactly does old school mean and what does that mean for us versus what that means for people who are a decade younger than us or two decades younger than us or what the case may be because I'm sure there are some people who go checks what are they <laughs> um that's sort of a sidebar uh so losing religion, losing faith in institutions. I find um, that notion of losing faith in our institutions different and very separate in my view from um, friendships, relationships, um, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and we have been losing faith in our institutions for decades now um, from the point where organizations started firing people and laying people off. Um, when organizations stopped having loyalty to the people who worked for them, that's when we started losing faith in our institutions. And um, I know this is particularly true for Gen X, um, people in that generation who really witnessed the breakdowns of um, their parents' marriages and um, other, you know, other institutional things that were going on during those times. So I think that this is not, I'm not sure we're at an inflection point with respect to lack of faith in our institutions. I think that's been going on for some time now um, and maybe amplified um, and not just amplified, but so much more like the language that we're using when we're talking uh, at each other or through each other, to each other in public discourses um, so much more um divisive mm -hmm. the right word there divisive than it used to be you know so it's harder to find those places of connections and common grounds and i think feels to me like there's more political agendas that come into places like school board meetings for instance than used to be the case um and that kind of thing so it's kind of like to me it's like this huge huge topic um that is um kind of really hard to know what to do with other than looking for where our, ent our entry points into being able to host those conversations. Um, when I think about relationships and um, social connection, <laughs> um, I think about I think about that from a number of perspectives. Um, I am now a person who has had friendships for decades, but I am and I have some friendships from when I was in school, you know, growing up, but there are like few and far between also because small school, small town. Um, 
And I think like what it means to meet in friendship now seems to be different than maybe what it meant to meet in friendship at an earlier stage in my life or whatever the case may be. I, I don't know. Um, and I find also that I'm, I'm have such a low tolerance for drama these days that it influences the friendships that I'm able to really engage with. Um, so there's that, but this need for social connection, I think is, is um, hmm. growing and it's more prevalent. I'm, I'm hosting a, um, a mentoring circle of women business owners. And we just had our second meeting yesterday. And the intent is to help uh, each other sort of grow our businesses. But the beyond that, and even more important, really seems to be this um, need for social connection. And this need to show up in a group where you can say the things that are true for you, the things that are difficult to say, the things that um, people feel some shame around or guilt or grief around um and that all gets named into that space and you know <laughs> we didn't know each other two weeks ago <laughs> we're just we're just meeting now and the the um depth of sharing in that group is astonishing in one on one level not for any of us because we all know what happens when we can gather in circle and um and the need for that is just so deep and and important. So this this group that's intended to serve one purpose actually is going to serve a deeper and more important purpose um, throughout it all. So um, and then you know friendships in general, I think it's a question sometimes for me of how much time and energy I have to fuel. Some of them, because as much as I'd like to meet people for coffee every week, or maybe the same people, um, it's just not available to me. So those are like all the kind of sparky things that emerged from listening to the two of you. Mm, wow. So I'm going to come back to something Kathy just said, which was not what I was going to originally say, which is, you know, in our little book on grandparenting, I, I, I tell two stories. Uh, one is my grandmother was the postmaster in a small town. And so people from about a five mile radius or roughly, I don't know, whatever it was, till the next radius of the nearest post office to get their mail, they came to the post office. And I remember after she'd done all the work of putting all the mail in the post boxes, then out front, in front of all the post boxes, were a bunch of chairs. And she would sit there in the mornings and people would come and go all morning long and, and chit chat and connect a little bit and get their mail and go. And, and it was like, I got enough time to sit here for a minute or two or, and visit for a few folks and wander on kind of thing. My grandfather had a barber shop, and on Saturday nights he opened it up and cut hair. And the men came because who's going to go to get my who? Which woman's going to go get my grandfather's cut her hair? That'd be a disaster. He only knew one haircut, you know. Uh, um, but they all kind of chatted for a bit and left. And it wasn't like a large amount of intrusive time in anybody's life, but it was a a connecting activity. And I don't know what kinds of connecting activities we really have much like that anymore. So I'm just going to say that and, and let it drop because when I was visiting with my friend Warren, um, I, I said, you know, this after he's like, uh, he's retired and he's wondering what he's going to do with his life now. So here you are leading an important organization um, as a professional for the past 20 some years and then a career before that. And now he's, you know, 73 and retired and like all of a sudden what's what's going on um and his partner retired both of them this summer um and 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 she's got lots going on and we, the conversation what is it about men that have one friend or two friends and nothing else going on in their lives and women have all kinds of stuff she's got five or six friends they do all kinds of things together 
you know, kinds of stuff. And he's sitting around kind of you know, wondering. And I've seen that in, in a lot of circumstances, you know, um, this something different about women in connections and relationships and groups and things. So out of my parents, I, I see it even in my own kind of life. Um, and so I just, I told him the story of, of how we came to what we're doing in the moment here now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we hadn't connected for quite some time and part of the pandemic and other things. And last spring we pinged each other and chatted and chatted again and again. And we decided to kind of do this recording thing. And it makes me wonder, you know, there's the systems thinking playbook. And I was like, what about the joyful connection playbook? <laughs> you know, I mean, what are the fun things that we could do to connect with each other? You know, um, like we're doing now. You know, we don't know whether these conversations are deep or not or playful or not, but we I think we come to them with an with an energy of openness and curiosity and playfulness. Um, even if it's online even if it's not in person. And and he's like, wow, that's, you know, I hadn't really thought about anything like that. You know, maybe I should think about something like that with some of my friends or here or there. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I, you know, institutions, we can run through capitalism and individualism and celebrating the individual and all of that. And then we can find a gazillion reasons why we are, in this moment in time where people are feeling disconnected, even though we're social animals and our, our survival depends, depended at one time on interconnection. Um, but what's, what's, what's the joyful playbook? You know, what's the systems thinking handbook? What's the joyful interconnection handbook uh, um, that we just kind of, go out and do I, I i don't know what that is but i'm intrigued peace back well damn you again jerry nagel <laughs> uh yeah you know interesting playful so i'll follow it a little bit um the the, the playbook joyful connecting playbook um I, I realize that in thinking that there could be a whole list of things like, well, go for coffee, go bowling, go gardening together, read a book together, you know, all those kind of things. And yay, those might be wonderful. Uh, I can't, and, and are, I mean, I love some of those things, right? I can't help but look underneath it. Like there's some, some anthropologist in me or sociologist in me or psychologist in me that, that says, and and or, or spiritualist for that matter. What what is the human hunger that is beyond bowling together and beyond the coffee together? And I suppose in the spirit of making up or reclaiming some of those stories, um, you know, the spaces for I like your stories, Jerry, of the 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 uh, the chit chat in the post office and in the barber shop, places where some of that fulfillment happens and it you know at some level it's true it's about i met george at the barbershop and we just yak it up every time we go and i love it you know and sometimes it is the post office like hey how are your kids doing genie that kind of stuff i i can't help but think that there is some inherent uh instinctive desire uh that that oh, shit that, that like knows the fulfillment of a connection. Gosh, even when I say that though, I realize, I, I feel like there's a societal movement away from the simplest of connections, but maybe, oh gosh, and that might be a North American Western world kind of thing. But there are many of us that are trying to reclaim some of those basic connections. And some of that is through facilitation and workshops and the kinds of things that the three of us are involved in. Um, Earlier today, I was listening to a, a podcast that was about anxiety, anxiety and panic attacks. Mm. And one of the things that uh, the person on this podcast spoke is that there's the instinctive fears that we have, you know, epigenetically, evolutionary, biology wise, that saber tooth tiger is going to eat me, I'm afraid. 
and and uh, you know it is it is baked into human beings to ha have anxiety so as to prevent things like that that aren't real today or generally are not real today from happening. So there's that. And then he was naming a second uh, fundamental fear for human beings is being ostracized from the social community. And again, from an evolutionary biological perspective, because that meant, yeah, probably aren't going to make it, you know, um, despite that sort of strength of maverick mentality in much of the, the Western world. Well, when I play with that, let myself play with it away from the fear modality, I wonder if there is just like an, an equal love hope instinct that has us not necessarily, you know, cognitively articulating why it feels good to chat at the barbershop but just going home and, and you know, for most people saying, gosh, it was sure good to talk to George. How was your day? I got to talk to George today, that kind of thing. So I, I guess I want to believe. And maybe I'm trying to give myself permission also to live from that, that, uh, that, that basic desire and welcome <laughs> damn, to just love even the simplest of connections. And, and like back to something you said, Kathy, I don't find for myself that I just, you know, that I'm desperate to connect around anything. There's a certain vibe. There's a certain feel, I think, when two or 20 or a bunch of human beings have like even the, the tiniest of let's sense make a bit together and it might be through our own individual stories, or it might be through what's going on in the world. I think there's something about the, you know, the inquiry or the curiosity to sense make together that I, I find fulfilling. Like that's the kind of humaning I want to do or keep doing, you know, hmm. I'll stop there. Well, thinking about barbershops or coffee shops or whatever the case may be, um, my neighborhood's a walking neighborhood. Mm. Lots of people out walking all the time or out, um, working in their yards or, um, walking dogs, you know, for, for the most part. And I realized that's where a lot of social connection happens in this neighborhood or this community is, um, you know, I see my neighbor out in the yard and I'll go make a point of going to ch chat with her or my neighbor. Um, beside me or when I go for a walk I'll meet various neighbors up and down the street and you'll stop and have a little chat sort of along the way so it's it's um it's a different form I think of some of that that social connection and kind of finding each other and I know that there are groups that go to coffee shops regularly at you know 10 o'clock in the morning and they they gather for their coffee um and there was one hotel Jerry and I used to stay in where the same group of people showed up there every morning for breakfast or um, whatever. And that could be, we could, we, it could be weeks or months from us when we were there and you go back and there they are again um, you know, at the same table kind of joining each other. So I think that people do find ways of making social connection when they want to, if they want to. Um, I do think that anxiety is a huge impairment for some people to be able to go out and do that. Um, but I think, I think a lot of people have it in, in their own way. Uh, interesting what you, your question about, is there an equal sort of love hope equation to the, um, uh, fear equation and ostracized from, um, community and whatnot. And we know, from the brain and behavioral science work that we incorporate into worldview intelligence that, you know, the, the main purpose of the brain is to keep us safe. And we're much more responsive and reactive to those things that cause us pain and fear than we are to the things that cause us joy and connection, which is kind of fascinating. So we have to actively um, be seeking that out uh, in order to, to really, I think in order to really find it. So there's there's just sort of a random thing that popped into my head. The other thing that's very present for me is um, Jerry and I are in the process of trying to put together an invitation for an art of hosting training because 
we have discovered that there seems to be much more interest um, than I would have anticipated uh, in Minnesota and surrounding areas. And um, when I look back at the invitations from two years ago or three years ago, like pre-COVID, they don't resonate for me in the same way. And part of it is this connection piece that yes, we want to develop the skills. Yes, we want to learn how to host and and facilitate and all of that. But um, people are really looking for reconnecting and finding other people who they feel that kind of resonance with and alignment with um, where they can have those conversations and be honest about the things that they're passionate about and bring them joy, but also the things that cause them angst. And so that's kind of what I've been sitting with as I've been thinking about what does the tenor of those invitations need to be? Cause we don't want to lose the skill piece, but um, we also, I think, need to really focus on renewal of relationship. Oh. Yeah, I want, there's, so I've gone walking with Kathy in her neighborhood. And one of the things I like about that is um, people say hi to each other. It's very rare when someone doesn't say hi or good morning to each other when they pass. Um, uh, and I, I really like that. Um, similarly, I, I go on a bike ride pretty much every morning and I go down to a particular area where there's a b bike path and walking path that are, you know, beside each other, bikes one, one, and one. And I try to say hi or wave at everybody I go by on my bike. You know, if they, you know, so if they were going in opposite directions and, you know, over the course of the summer, people that basically won't even look at you <laughs> by the end of the summer, you know, will say hi or, or wave or whatever. Um, but what's always kind of strikes me is the time it takes for people to move from looking down to not, you know, not seeing anything or anybody <laughs> just to seeing what's around them and not just the humanity people but the nature too but um i it, 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 i don't care how long somebody won't look at me won't wave won't smile won't whatever and you know i feel like by the end of the summer in a way a kind of a community has emerged i don't know anybody's name mm -hmm. you know in in any of that i see some of the walkers will stop and visit with each other because they're walking their dog or their we got a couple of little old ladies that have strollers with their cats in that they crack me up, but they're always out there in the morning with their two strollers walking with their cats. And, and I, I just like, I know that is, there are some people that, that never ever look up. Their head is always down. And, and I try not to make up a story about why that's happening, but um it is interesting the time it takes to, to now I'll find that some, particularly the men that are older, may be more likely to wave or say hi. And, and for whatever reasons, culturally, or cause I'm an older guy too. So there, I'm not any threat to anybody, you know, in that sense. Um, but um, what's the practice of, of, I mean, of saying hi, of smiling, of waving, of whatever, that that I'm not trying to come on to you. I'm not trying to do something to you. I'm not trying to invade your space. I'm just trying to be a human being of warmth. That that's that's hard. It it just seems. It, I don't know what you do in Kathy, but in Canada, but here we have this every August they have this sort of neighborhood night out. So once a freaking year, once neighborhoods get together to have a potluck picnic once. And it's, it's like a big special deal, you know, and, and it's like, Oh, and the rest of the year we're like in our little cocoons. That seems, but anyway, 
I think part of the playbook is just no matter how much you're ignored, at least carry the energy of welcome. What does that look like? What's the energy of welcome out there? And I'm, you know, that's all I try to carry on my bike as I going around and wave or smile or whatever. I'm not trying to project anything other than, you know, here we are out for a walk, out for a bike ride. Look at the eagles up on the roof of that house. You know, look at, you know, um, kind of stuff. Huh. Yeah. That's my question. What's the energy of welcome that feels yeah. lost? I don't know. Yep. Shake up the order, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think I'm kind of um, coming to the end of a thread uh, for me. I was just marveling how we kind of moved from this big question about our lack of faith in institutions to really hone in and focus on social connection and, um, you know, what that means. And I'm so aware of how essential it is for our health and our well-being. And, um, you know, whether it it is like Jerry's described around a, a wave or a smile passing by each other on the street, uh, which is uh, uplifting for a lot of people. Like when you see people begin to smile at you as you're walking by, like that's, I think that, that that's really good. And I think I am mm -hmm. left a little bit with this question of how much... Mm -hmm social connection do I need? I don't even think that's the right question because, you know, I think about yesterday we had, um, was it yesterday or Monday, we had the Worldview Intelligence Community of Practice call. And that was definitely another form of social connection, safe space for people to to speak in um, things that were true for them and that they're, they're dealing with and walking away kind of feeling like I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm with my people. And so, I, I wonder if like this notion of social connection goes everywhere from that. I pass you by on the street and I wave to um, we create the space for um, well, individual conversations, but then also these group conversations where people feel heard and validated and acknowledged and like they're part of a group who um, understands and experiences many of the same things um, that that I do individually or they do individually. And I think all of the degrees of that are probably really important to our health and well-being. Um, and for me, fuels me. You know, I'm, I'm, I was fueled by that Worldview Intelligence call. I was fueled by that call last night um, with these uh, women business owners um, and I'm fueled by this conversation that we're having right now. Well, I'll pick up and and sort of weave in a bit of checkout of our space also then. Um, uh, lots of sparks for me as we are talking and, you know, trying to, uh, trying to just be a good noticer of where this plays in mm -hmm. the varied layers of, my life or our lives um because i am thinking of uh you know not every community is one where you wave at each other mm -hmm. or you say hello like some and i i love this actually sometimes it is just a nod like there's right. a head nod, <laughs> ever so subtle right you know the, like the, the head just goes up ever so slightly and it, it, i i like i feel something tremendously satisfying in that and i don't even know why like it it might even just be you know a momentary gosh this sounds so exaggerated but what the hey a letting down of the guard like yeah. when strangers pass or meet or whatever you know one version of connection is like hey how are you kind of stuff practicing the welcome and one version is i'm not going to hurt you and you're not going to hurt me and just that little, you know, sometimes that's what that head nod is to me. So yep. think of that. An acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement, Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is, right. And um, there is something like like in the, 
Ah, damn it. Well, let's see, maybe I'll tuck it in this way for me anyway. Um, we we are, the three of us, among many things, we are all facilitators. We do things with groups of people and try to create good things. And I I know that like behind the professional job description that goes along with that or, you know, something in that direction, I, I'm just... I, I'm a person who carries a hunger for uh, places to interact a little bit with with these basic questions, like who are you as a human being and what's it like to be you as a human being? And I, I think that's easy to bake into workshops of varied participants and all of that. It might not sound like that, but the you know what lives behind it can be the same. And I think that's just speaking to <clears throat> maybe trying to loop back to the beginning here again, desire for connection, the healthiness of connection, uh, the healthiness of many different forms of connection, and maybe just some inherent desire going all the way back to where you started, Jerry, of like interrupting, interrupting some of the toxic patterns and maybe contributing to some of the appreciative patterns yeah, that doesn't say it all, but boy, I I feel like that's time and energy and heart and belly and mind well spent when it points in that direction. Wow, that's a lot. I'll stop there. <laughs> Go to our conversation today. I have too. Just one last little thing. Um, in listening to all of this, uh, is we sparked by your notion of the nod uh, Tennyson is when was the last time any of us were out on a rural road and passed somebody and we did the one finger wave off our, <laughs> steer, our steering wheel you know yeah that doesn't happen on the interstate you know and maybe it's the two finger wave uh, somebody here one time did a whole little essay on you know mm -hmm. is it the difference between the one finger and two finger wave and it's like you recognize the person or not in their car or whatever but Again, that little bit of we're passing each other. It's on a rural road. There's in our culture acknowledgement. We're human beings out here on a small road going this way. You know, we're not at each other. Um, yeah, it's it's um, acknowledgement of humanity and connection of some kind. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love where this conversation has gone and it now makes me curious and hungry for the next one. Cool beans. <laughs>